roll. Well, I want to welcome everyone that's on so far to our city commission, council, and township board training. Uh, we'll add people in as they, they join us, but we appreciate all those that uh, have gotten on early or by 7.30. So again, welcome. I'm Kathy Brubaker-Clark with the Greater Muskegon Economic Development, GMED. And along with our partners, the Lakeshore Chamber of Commerce and the Community Foundation of Muskegon County, we're providing this training seminar virtually. Uh, we thought even despite COVID, we thought this was a good way to go because it gives everybody locally a chance to participate in the training without having to drive to Lansing or some other place far away, which you'd never get your whole council commission or board to be able to go to attend something like that. Um, in addition, we want you to know that this training is being recorded and we will have it on our GMED website um, at some point after we're done so that you can go back to refresh yourselves if you need to and please encourage other members of your council commission or board that we're not able to attend this morning to go on and, and watch the webinar as well on our, our website. Our trainer today is Nancy Oley. She's a strategic and tech, technical expert in organizational development and training, strategic planning, and managing performance improvement initiatives. She works extensively with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation on various training seminars, and we are fortunate to have her leading our training today. I would also like to introduce Emily Morgenstern from the Chamber of Commerce. Emily. Hi, everyone. And, and Contessa Hood from GMED. Contessa. Morning. <laughs> uh, they will be hosting our webinar today, and they'll also be addressing your questions to Nancy during the question and answer portion of this webinar. We'll have two question and answer sessions. Um, in the meantime, please feel free if you've got a question or you don't understand something as Nancy is going through the training, uh, just put that in the question and answer box or the chat box and Emily and Contessa will be monitoring those so that when it comes to the question and answer time, they can address your questions. We'll have two question and answer times, one about 8.20 and then another at the end around 9.20. And with that, I will turn it right over to Nancy. Nancy, we're looking Kathy, forward to our training today. Kathy, Emily, Contessa, thank you so much for hosting this webinar. And just want to, to let you know that, that as, as you're considering some of your questions today, um, it, you may want to put them in the chat box right away, or you may want to write them down and put them in closer to 820, as you may find that some of your questions are actually answered as we go through the presentation. Um, I've got a little bright light in my face that's going to go away in just a couple minutes as the sun is coming up on us here, but initially wanted to go through the agenda for you um, so that you know the topics that we are going to be covering in this morning's webinar. Um, we are definitely going to be starting out with the basics. And so a little bit about some of the governments that you, that you represent in your role. Uh, we will be going through parliamentary procedure. Um, not every commission and council and board actually uses par parliamentary procedure, but it is the most commonly used methodology for handling meetings. Uh, we will be talking about you being the face of, of your county, your city, your township, and what that means in terms of representation of your board um, and, and really speaking with one voice to your community. And then actually um, looking at policy making boards, because many of you going into these roles, um, you may have gone from a, a working board uh, in your community to moving into a policy making board. And, and I'm just gonna say right now, for the operation side of most cities, townships, county government, um, villages, the people who are paid to administer and paid to make sure 
that the, the city or that the township is running, um, they will thank you a thousand times over if you actually stay in your lane in terms of policy making and don't be getting into their business in terms of the day-to-day -day operations of, of running the city or the township. So we will be touching on that. And then we will also be looking just very briefly at setting goals and doing that within the, uh, the context of your strategic plan. So those are the topics that we are going through today. And, um, and we will welcome your questions as they come through. Uh, we will also welcome a little bit of discussion from you all as you chime in on some of those questions. So in starting out, the first thing that you need to know in your roles is that you are a legislative body. You are given authority by the state constitution and state law to actually enact local law. And within that, you are policy makers. And as you are setting so a policy, as you are amending policy, um, your, your chief responsibilities there as policy makers are to really to listen to all of your constituents in your community. Your job is to represent the majority in your community, not just a special interest group. And you are a policy making board, not an operating board. And I know that, um, that this, was a, this was a big shift in mentality for me personally. Um, I have sat on numerous working boards in my community. And to make that shift from, from having um, operating responsibilities to actually moving into setting the policy that others then um, are guided by was a big shift. I mean, there's a lot of fulfillment in doing the operating side. Um, there is an even larger fulfillment in knowing that you are setting the tone in your community as a policy making board. Um, as a legislative body, you are also decision makers. So as we've clearly said, <clears throat> you are not administration or operations. Um, you are not micromanagers. Uh, those who are not satisfied with the outcome, they can always seek to change their representative by voting them in or out of office. Now, uh, it, it's very interesting doing a lot of work through the years with the Michigan Municipal League. Um, I, I, I remember distinctly um, a, a city council, um, uh, th this was in uh, a, a city in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and the, the, the city manager was getting so many complaints about inefficiencies. You know, um, city council members would actually stop uh, Department of Public Works people on the street and say, can you, can you leave this particular job? Can you move to another job? Because my phone is ringing off the hook with constituents. And he literally, at one, uh, the city manager at one point said, anybody who works for the city, you do not respond to a council member's requests on the spot. Just say to them, call the manager's office, and if it makes sense, I will move you um, to, to whatever that, that customer need is within the city. And, and I remember having that conversation with that city manager and saying, um, you do know that you're probably gonna be fired within the year. And he said, if I get fired within the year, it is because I have been advocating for my people and I've been advocating for our taxpayers because in fact, um, we have all sorts of inefficiencies that are happening within our city as a result of people responding to council members' needs directly instead of going through the proper channels. Now, that city manager didn't get fired within the year, but he was fired within the next two years. I also said to him, though, there's no city manager that does not, um, if they're worth their salt, lose their job at some point in time for making, you know, for being assertive enough for making decisions. But the point that I'm, I'm looking to make here is do not put that city manager in that position. 
do not go from decision makers and policy makers to trying to micromanage. Know what the chain of command is there. Call that city manager or that township supervisor who is going to act on those constituent needs. Please do pick up the phone when your constituents are calling and let them know that there are issues within the community. But do not try to handle those things yourself. So, in case you didn't get the the you know the the memo here that that we feel passionate about this, we clearly feel passionate about this. Now let's look at your responsibilities as policymakers, as decision makers. So, because you are setting policy um, within your community. Uh, one of your first responsibilities is as a strategic planner. And your council, your commission, your township board is there to set long and the long and short term vision to do planning um, around your city, your township, your village, your county, and to set those annual goals in light of that strategic plan. And so that big picture planning is where everything starts. In addition, in terms of your responsibilities, you are charged with reviewing and approving uh, the annual budget. Your job is to oversee the performance of your city manager. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, um, with John Carver's rules of board management. But if you Google Carver um, and, and look at, you know, it, it pick up some of, it, of his books or uh, Carver's organization, take a look at some of their journal articles, um, they do some really solid work around overseeing the performance of, of those in charge within your city. And one of the nicest things that I see uh, within Carver's board rules of, of governance is that rather than you telling your city manager um, what exactly they are to do, instead you set your goals for the year, you tell your city manager what they can't do. So you give them their boundaries and then you get out of their way so they can actually get that work done for the city. So all roads lead back to that first box on the left-hand side in terms of the strategic planning, the goal setting for the year, the parameters, the financial parameters for the year. And then you give those goals, you hand those off uh, to the leadership within your city, tell them what they can't do, their boundaries, and then oversee their performance. And of course, they're gonna be reporting back to you on a continual basis. Now you also have fiduciary responsibilities. So you will be entering into legal contracts. You are a legislative branch of government. So you will pass ordinances and resolutions within um, your city or village or township. You will represent the community to other levels of government, you will enforce or modify your city charter. And by the way, just a little aside on representing the community to other levels of government, um, you may be doing some of that through resolution. Um, having worked with a lot of um, smaller communities around the state of Michigan, I oftentimes am encouraging are elected to be working with other um, other you know township government working with with cities working with the county because oftentimes you have the same concerns and rather than reinventing the wheel what you can find is that by meeting with each other you can really get some momentum around some issues of policy within your communities and can be um, quite powerful just in terms of sharing the same concerns and going back to your constituents and, and pulling those constituents and finding out that, that, that we can, we're really on the same page 
And, and, and that can that can really speak to your communities in terms of efficiencies and effectiveness. In addition, um, in terms of your responsibilities, adoption of zoning ordinances and amendments, um, as, as you take a look at the, the use of property um, within your, your city, um, you absolutely will have zoning ordinances there. Um, the setting of fees within um, your city or within your township. You'll also be looking at permits, applications, requests for action, uh, approval of planning commission members in accordance with the Municipal Planning Act 33 um, that, that, that goes back to 2008. Um, and your, your planning commission members um, within MEDC, we are seeing a lot of grants within communities and those grants are incumbent upon uh, redevelopment ready communities of which your planning commission members um, have a solid role within that. You'll regulate land use through your zoning laws, approval of tax rates, and you'll regulate business activity through licensing and regulations. So as you can see, when we say, you know, you, you have so many responsibilities within the, um, the policy side, um, this comes through loud and clear. Now, your executive's responsibilities is to carry out council or commission directives. So as we say, when you are taking a look at, at what your city manager is doing, your township supervisors, they are carrying out what you are directing and they are implementing your, the policies that are adopted by council or commission. Now, when we take a look at your role of city, um, village manager, county administrators, township supervisors, so how are they interacting with you? Well, they are attending your meetings. They are preparing the business to be considered for you. So they are putting together uh, those board packets, giving you a lot of data and information there so that you are prepared to make good decisions. They're gathering data, they're developing and evaluating some alternatives so that they can give you some recommendations. They may also be making policy recommendations for you. And then clearly they are carrying out the intentions of, of your board and they are managing your staff. So with all of that said, now, now we know the role between you as elected and then the role of administration in terms of implementation. Let's just give you a, a little basics on 101, the forms of, of local government. Um, because within the state of Michigan, um, we have, within cities, we may have a mayor council or we may have a council manager uh, form of government. On your mayor council, policy and administration are definitely separate. All legislative and policy making power in that form of government is vested in city council and administrative authority is vested in uh, directly elected mayors or county executives. So directly elected mayor or, or county executive. Now in a council manager form of government, all legislative and policy powers are vested in city council. Council hires your city manager who heads administrative branch of government the city manager then will carry out council policies. Um, but the difference here between your mayor council and council manager is rather than having an elected mayor in a council manager form of government, your manager is selected by council members. And your mayor then will preside at council meetings as well as any, any of the ceremonial duties that they might have within your city. Um, and they are actually a voting member of, of your council. Township government, um, assessment administration is done, um, elections administration and tax collection, 
which are legally assigned functions of the township supervisor um, or the clerk or treasurer respectively. And in township government, we are looking at budget responsibilities, accounting, investments. We're looking at um, similar to what you would see in a city council enacting and enforcing ordinances as well as zoning along with township trustees. Village government organized primarily to establish local regulatory ordinances and to provide local services such as fire uh, protection, police protection to your community, um, public works services, as well as utilities. And then county commissions, we are looking at policy making that deals directly with the, the county, county budget, appropriations, uh, personnel, capital improvements, all the services that are covered by county government and any other internal matters. And policy making is through resolutions, through legislative oversight, and then um, chartering of those, of those constituent services. So you've now got your background in terms of various forms of government. And if you want to get deeper into those, um, uh, you know, if, if you Google the MTA, you Google within Michigan Municipal League, um, they actually have a, a ton of information available to you that they now uh, prepare online for you, which is absolutely lovely. But we need to give you information that's going to give you some, some background about why you will run your meetings the way you run your meetings. Um, and, and this is all framed within operating in what, operating within what we call the Sunshine or the Sunshine Act. And really what we are talking about is advocating in local government, um, operating in the open of the public so that we are extremely transparent about everything that we are doing within local government. So a basic premise of democracy is that the public's business is going to be conducted in the realm of the public. And this requirement is particularly necessary in a representative democracy. So we've got legislation that go all the way back to the 70s that spell out the people's right to know and also set limits and parameters on council's actions. And uh, I am confident that you have heard the terminology around the Open Meetings Act, as well as the Freedom of Information Act. And, and some of you have, have probably, even before you ta you've taken on your role, you might have, have FOIA'd um, local government for information. And the policy of the state of Michigan is that the public is entitled to full and complete information regarding the affairs of local government and the actions of those who represent them. And when I am doing work with councils and commissions, you know, it, one of the things that I will often say to them is when, before you speak, and actually before you think, you know, as you are thinking, do everything that you're going to do as if it were going to hit, you know, the, the front page of the free press, uh, because you need to be thinking about representing your, your board, your council, your commission out in the open. And um, it, I, I, I will tell you, um, I, I worked with a, a city, and this is a number of years ago, um, but the city actually called me to come in and, and be a neutral facilitator uh, because they had such problems getting along. I mean, um, if any of you have heard me at a Michigan Townships Association annual meet, um, conference, um, you know, I, I will chat with people about playing nice in the sandbox with each other. And one of the reasons you need to play nicely in the sandbox with each other is that if you ever need to float a millage and you act with just like just a bunch of nutcases with each other, 
your public is not going to trust your capability in decision making and you're not going to get that millage passed. And now you're going to be between a rock and a hard spot in your ability to provide services within your community. And so um, I, uh, a after doing that workshop with this particular city, the the headlines of their local paper the next day said, consultant tells council to grow up. Now, I did not use that, that terminology. Um, that reporter probably was reading my mind a little bit <laughs> because that is what I was probably thinking. But there are ramifications of our actions. And so that need to act within the oversight of the public is so critical to what we do. And it's actually mandated in terms of how we operate. So the requirements of the Open Meeting Act actually ask us um, for all persons to be permitted to attend a public meeting and address council on any item. And one of the things that gives a, a lot of us heartburn is that that person, you know, those people who are attending meetings, they do not have to be a resident. So yes, you will have people at your meetings that are representing um, interest groups out there and they come off as if they are representing your local community and they are not, but they have as much of a right to be there as anyone else. Rules can require that each speaker identify their name, address, and any other unique interest at the time of public comment. But again, that those rules are, are subject to the community that you represent. Comment can be on any governmental issue that the speaker feels may be, may, uh, be of concern to the residents in your community. Each person is entitled to record, to televise, videotape, or broadcast a public meeting. Um, and we know that within the majority of your communities, um, you are finding it good practice to tape your meetings um, and, and oftentimes broadcast that on, on your local uh, public broadcasting stations. Because we know that even with the Open Meetings Act, we have a lot of residents who would like to know what's going on at those meetings, but they actually don't make the effort to show up to that meeting unless there's really um, a, a heartburn issue that's going on with them. Um, but we want our public informed and the Open Meetings Act supports that. We also say within the Open Meetings Act, uh, Act that it's recommended practice to literally send a signal to the public to keep the door open to your meeting rooms or post signage saying that the meeting is open to the public. In addition, in terms of the Open Meetings Act, reasonable rules can be put in place to minimize the possibility of disruptions at your meetings. Those rules should be in writing and they should be published where the community does have access to them. So these are not hidden in the bowels somewhere of, um, uh, of, uh, of Township Hall, uh, but actually should be very transparent to your community. You do need to know that if a person is, is disruptive at one of your meetings, they can be excluded from the rest of that meeting. Uh, but they cannot be excluded from your next meeting as a result of having behaved uh, badly at a meeting. So this is not the NFL um, it, where if you are tossed from a game, you know, you're excluded from the uh, first quarter of that next game. No. Uh, people can attend that next meeting. Warning should be given though to people before removing citizens. So if you are that, that mayor, um, if you're that supervisor um, running that meeting, um, you should be giving a pe you know, people a warning in advance. In addition, on the requirements of the Open Meeting Act, it requires that time be set aside for public comment at each meeting. Now, this doesn't guarantee that everyone will be able to speak on any, uh, on any topic because you will have time limits set forth uh, for speakers on total time. 
And that, um, that is up to you again to determine whether that public comment is taking place at the beginning or at the end of that meeting. You can designate um, when that is going to take place. The however is you do want to have time limits set. And um, I know I speak on um, board education for redevelopment ready communities with the MEDC. And I've also worked one-on-one uh, -on -one with a lot of communities that have had difficulty getting people to, um, to be interested in, in local government positions. And sometimes that happens for something as simple as that community, that city council, that township board has not set, set time limits on public comments. And what happens as a result is that board meetings are going to 11, 12 o'clock, sometimes later at night um, when there are hot issues in that community. Whereas if you had set a, a two minute or a three minute um, time limit, you give more people the opportunity to speak during that public comment but it also means that, that pu those public comments are done in a reasonable period of time and we don't have meetings going on forever. Since your meetings are to ensure that your municipality's business is to be done, your presiding officer will maintain order and the presiding officer has the agenda and will cover those agenda items. General public cannot challenge parliamentary rule rulings of your board so you can run your meeting the way uh, it is designed to be run. And the public has no right to address the board during your deliberations. They can address during public comment, but when you are in deliberations, they do not have that right to address your board during that time. So that's information on the Open Meetings Act. Uh, because of that sunshine rule, we also have the Freedom of Information Act. And FOIA states that all people, regardless of those in prison, upon written request, have a reasonable opportunity to inspect, copy, receive copies of requested information, anything on the public record of a public body. And your obligation within your township, your city, your village, your county, you have five business days to respond to a FOIA request. Now, what we are finding is that FOIA requests can be quite expensive. And uh, before people um, were doing a lot of FOIA requests, oftentimes cities would just, you know, they would copy that information and they would give that um, to that citizen but we are seeing more and more um, expensive requests coming your way. And because of that, um, you can assign a reasonable charge to process that request. So just think about policing these days and, and um, you know, wearing body cams and what it might cost uh, a sheriff's office, if you're in a county or a police department, um, to process all of that body cam um, information or redact things um, that are not pertinent. That can be very expensive. Um, and so you can assign a reasonable charge to process that. But again, it's gotta be reasonable. We are under, I mean, the reason we have the Freedom of Information Act so that people have access to that information. Now, within your Open Meetings Act, public notice requirements are specific to the type of meetings. So for regular meetings of a public body, you will post within 10 days after the first meeting of a public body in your um, calendar or your fiscal year a public notice that states the dates, the times, and the places of your regular meetings for the upcoming year. If you have a change of schedule of your regular meetings, you will post within three days after the meeting uh, at, uh, uh, when you make that change, a public notice 
starting the new dates, the times and places of regular meetings. So if you've got any amendments there, you're gonna post those. For regular, uh, for rescheduled regular or special meeting of a public body, a public notice um, will be issued stating the date, the time and the place of the meeting at least 18 hours before that meeting. And, and oftentimes that posting is coming on, you know, um, on the door of, of city, um, city hall or township offices. And a meeting, and, and, I, and I should say on your website as well, and a meeting of a public body which is recessed for more than 36 hours shall be reconvined, reconvened only after you have given public notice again within 18 hours beforehand, letting the public know at what time you're gonna be reconvening that meeting. Now, there's some of the parameters. And again, why are we doing this? Because we're talking about the Open Meeting Act and we want people to be able to attend those meetings. Now, in terms of decision-making and decision-making being uh, made in public meetings, all decisions must be made at meetings open to the public. And the Open Meetings Act defines decisions to mean a determination, an action, a vote, a disposition upon a motion, a proposal, a recommendation, a resolution, an order, an ordinance, a bill, a measure on which a vote or members of a public body are required and by which your public body effectuates or formulates that public policy that you are charged with doing. The Open Meeting Act provides that all decisions of a public body shall be made at a meeting open to the public, and that with limited exceptions, all deliberations of, of your council, your commission, your boards, constituting a quorum of your members shall take place at a meeting open to the public. Now, a little bit more on decision-making within the Open Meetings Act. Um, the Open Meetings Act does not contain a voting requirement or any form of formal voting requirement. What they do is ask for a consensus building process that equates to decision-making that would fall under the act. So let's give you an example here. Um, where board members use telephone calls, email, sub quorum meetings to achieve the same intercommunication that could have been achieved in a full board meeting or commission meeting, that member's conduct is susceptible to what the Open Meetings Act calls round the horn decision-making, which achieves the same effect as if your entire board had met publicly and formally cast its votes. Round the horn decision making violates the Open Meeting Act. So, what the Open Meetings Act is clearly telling you here is that you cannot be having that polycom in a conference room and talking to people and be making decisions where you've got a, a quorum of, of, of elected there, or sending an email to your entire board soliciting their opinions on, on issues, you have violated the Open Meetings Act if you go down that path. And again, what that's called is, is round the horn uh, decision making. So some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, I see people around my community and we run into each other. Um, we, we might go to public meetings together. Um, our children may attend the same schools. We're, we are gonna have instances where there are a, a, a quorum of us present. Well, quorums of your board may meet outside of an open meeting without violating the Open Meetings Act if it's a purely social or chance gathering. The however is at that chance gathering, you are not 
discussing public policy amongst members of your board. So if, if you all are attending your, your children's graduation, talk about the school, talk about you know, what their next steps are. Do not talk about something that is showing up on the agenda of your next board meeting. If you do, you are engaged in that round the horn decision-making and you are violating the Open Meetings Act. Um, you all can um, attend a, a civic organization's um, event. So I, I, I'm just thinking if, you know, we're looking at Muskegon, um, if, if we were Grand Rapids and you got Art Prize, and you, know, you all could attend Art Prize, you might even all be in the Van Andel Arena at the same time, but again, you are not discussing, deliberating toward um, policy uh, decisions or discussion at that event. Now, you may want to listen to concerns of neighborhood organizations. Actually, a couple years ago, um, I was facilitating a session up in Ludington. Um, Ludington City Council members just wanted to have a listening session with their public. And actually, I went up a little bit early and met with the elected up there and said, um, a listening session means you do not respond to the public. You are simply there to say thank you. Even if somebody is off base, you're saying thank you for that listening session. The however is if you do a listening session, you go to a neighborhood meeting, uh, you go to a nonprofit, you go to a rotary meeting um, and are addressing the public there, you know, letting them know some of the things that are coming up in the community. You do not deliberate toward or make any decisions when you are at that meeting. Now, you, you may go to educational forums. So you may go to in person um, or virtually like we are a workshop, a seminar, an informational gathering, a conference. Um, you may all attend that, but you are not having discussions toward policy when you are attending that event. Now, in terms of advising, advisory committees and your Open Meetings Act, the Open Meetings Act does not apply to committees and subcommittees composed of less than a quorum of your full public body if they're merely advisory or only capable of making recommendations, not decisions, but recommendations concerning the exercise of your governmental authority. Uh, if a non-committee board member participates in committee deliberations, however, the Open Meetings Act is violated. And um, I, I, I was in Clare, Michigan about a year and a half ago where we, we actually um, were, were kind of, it, it, uh, they were not clear on this. And so we had a very, very interested um, council member uh, who wanted to attend non-committee uh, meetings, you know, not ones that, that, that they sat on. And we said, yes, you can attend those. However, you cannot become an active participant in those discussions. If more than one committee meets together, each with less than a quorum of the board, but resulting in the presence of a quorum in total, you now have an open meeting and you must notify the public that a quorum will be present. So, you know, you have multiple committees that are getting together. You know, there's only two of you on each of those committees, but boy, when you bring those three committees together, now you've got a quorum that's a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Now, um, our caution flag to you as well in terms of the use of electronic communications with the Open Meeting Act is that if you have blogs, uh, um, if you reply all to emails, if you are replying with instant messaging with a quorum, that may in fact qualify as a meeting. 
So you've probably already been warned by your city managers, your township supervisor, you know, do not go down that path of, of, of replying all in an email. Uh, because if, if you have a quorum of your council or commission or board, uh, you have just in fact had a, a, a meeting uh, because of that quorum and you have violated the Open Meetings Act. Now, in addition, in terms of use of electronic communications, they are not to be used in open meetings toward decision making or deliberations. So you are not emailing each other in your council meeting. You are not texting each other in that meeting. You are not utilizing other social media for communications during an open meeting. You will violate the Open Meetings Act if you do so. So you may be tempted when you hear the comment from Jane Doe on your council and Henry, you and Henry, you know, are, are like-minded on an issue. Do not text Henry. Do not text the, uh, the rest of your board there. Um, you will violate the Open Meetings Act. Um, we say you may not vote by electronic communications. Um, instead, you will do even like we are, you know, using, you know, so many of you right now, you know, we are in a different world right now due to COVID. Um, but you, you don't do that by email. You do a roll call, you do a show of hands or other visible method of voting to the public, even if you are conducting your meetings virtually. Now, you may use email to distribute handouts, to get your agenda out. Um, to share statistical information, your board packets, uh, particularly when copies of that information are also made available to the public before or during your meeting. And, and so that's where you would use electronic communication. Now, about meetings. According to state law, a meeting occurs when a quorum of the members of your governing body or any committee of your members, whether standing or special meetings, um, remember, they are scheduled. Um, the, you, there is a notice from an authorized member of, of your council board or commission. So that meeting is at a designated time and place. Any public matter, official business or policy is to be discussed or presented. You're going to have official action taking place or in a committee where you're taking recommendations on a public matter official business or policy. If that's going to be formulated, presented, discussed, decisions made, you have a meeting. Now, we have regular meetings, and those are your regular meetings of council boards, commissions, um, where you are considering municipal business, where you're making policy decisions, where you're going to approve contracts, establish budgets, enact ordinances or resolutions, and how those regular meetings are, are, are conducted, the time or frequency of those, those are actually specified in your city charter or by ordinance. So there is no one size fits all for us. So it, it, um, you know, if, if you're thinking of asking a question about the time or frequency, I can't give you that answer that really is established in, in your charter. Now, Work sessions will provide members the opportunity to meet with staff in order to get into more difficult or, or complex issues and to, to take a look at, at some alternatives that we might be considering. Work sessions may be held immediately prior to a regular meeting or other times established by council. Pre-meeting work sessions may be used by council members to prepare for upcoming or regular meetings. They're less formal. They're used for gather, um, information gathering. You are not voting during a work session. And your work sessions, though, are also subject to the open meetings law. That's versus special meetings. And special meetings are used to discuss and vote on a very limited number of specific issues. So if you have a controversial rezoning request, you know, that, that might be addressed in a special meeting. You can also do a special meeting in an emergency 
the however, it really does have to be an urgent need that is addressed before your next regular meeting. And you've got to follow your charter in terms of announcing those special meetings. They can be really helpful if a large number of people would like to comment, and then that helps your, keep your regular meeting from going too long. Then you've got public hearings. And public hearings allow citizens to express opinions on matters of public concern. Now in a public hearing, again, you are not taking official action. Um, you may have a public hearing just to gather facts related to a proposed action or to gauge public opinion. Um, you know, land use issues are often a, a good place for us to have a public hearing. You may be having a town hall meeting to meet uh, members of the public and learn their concerns. Uh, a public hearing may be an opportunity for your citizens to vent regarding their frustrations. But again, a public meeting is, is not a decision making meeting. And, and so just thinking about public notice requirements, Again, um, we covered these earlier, so I'm not going to beat these to death with a stick. Um, but there are within the Open Meetings Act particular day re requirements that you announce those meetings to your public and have those displayed physically within your premises in a place that's very open to the eyeballs of the public, and then um, uh, on your, your websites in a very predominant place as well. Now, in terms of roles and responsibilities in meetings, your presiding officer, um, your mayor may vote in case of a tie or allowed to vote on all issues. It depends on, on, on whether you, um, you, you know, the, the, whether you are a mayor council um, body. Your mayor pro tem is going to serve in your mayor's absence. Your city, um, county, township clerks are your official record keepers in your meetings. They will prepare and distribute meeting agendas. They will also record your official minutes of meetings, including resolutions and decisions and votes of each of the elected, and that is a requirement. They will prepare and preserve all accounts of the city or the township or the county. And then we have other council members, trustees, commissioners. Um, you are policymakers. You will show respect for others' views. Um, oftentimes, actually, in meetings, I encourage people to literally say, you know, I respectfully agree. I respectfully disagree. Um, and you are charged with compromising for the good of the community. Your job is to exercise good judgment and, and logical decision making. And this can be tough because your phone may be ringing off the hook with emotionally charged issues in your community, but again, you think about that strategic plan, you think about the long-term good of your community, you do your due diligence on your issues, you read your board packets and you do that in advance of your meetings so that you can exercise that logical decision-making. You consider what impact the vocal minority may have on decision-making, but you consider the long-term and look at the unintended consequences of every decision that you might make. And you make decisions in keeping with your strategic plan or the master plans of your community. Now, um, we have gone just a little bit over. Um, so, so Emily, Contessa, um, Kathy, do we want to open it up for a few questions here before we get back to it. Yes, let's go ahead. I know there's a couple in the question and answer, so I'll let uh, Emily and Contessa address that, and maybe there's some others. This is your time to put your questions in. Yep, so our first question is if the PowerPoint will be available. This is being recorded with the PowerPoint. Um, Nancy, I don't know if you're able to send out the slides as well that we can share. 
Um, why don't I send those slides um, to you? And I feel very comfortable um, with you utilizing these within your own purview. Um, so yes, I will make those available to you. Um, they are copyrighted though. So, um, you know, please don't run off with these and go up to Mackinac Island and present these <laughs> to uh, something across the state, but absolutely we will make these available to you because that degree of detail um, is probably important to you. All right, thank you, Nancy. The next question is, if the city clerk is not present in a meeting to record a meeting, is this okay? Well, we have to have someone else assigned um, to that role. And again, th this uh, whoever that is, is assigned within your charter. Um, so Kathy, in your experience, who has taken that role when your clerk was not available? Well, Usually in my experience is more with a, a larger city. So there were staff within the clerk's office, but that's that would be my first answer is that if you do have other staff in the office, um, it's always a good idea, whatever staff people's positions are um, or even elected folks to have somebody that's always kind of in training with you so that if they're needed, they can step up to that position. Absolutely. And the one thing that you cannot do is not have someone record that meeting. No. Other questions? Yep, we have one more. Um, our work sessions, do they have to be noticed? Uh, it, it, yes, a any meeting of the public, yeah, we, we have to have a notice of that. All right, so that looks like all of our questions right now. Again, you guys can continually put them into the chat and we'll answer them later. Okay, okay. Well, let's continue on then. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we frame this within the Sunshine Act and the Open Meetings Act. So we actually have guidelines for agendas as well. A public notice, when you put this out for your agendas, um, you know, it, it, it should have, you know, the, the, the name of your council, your commission, your board. Um, it, it should have information so that people can contact you. So a, a telephone number, a link, um, whatever, a, as well as the address of where that meeting is going to take place. There is no requirement that the public notice um, actually have the agenda attached to that or um, a specific statement as to the purpose of the meeting. Um, but I find it just a, a, a good guideline that that information is available to the public. Um, it may be included on your official website, you know, link to the public meetings or on your homepage. Um, no agenda format is required by the Open Meeting Act. Um, but, and this one should get your attention, penalties for Open Meetings Act violations. Any public official who intentionally violates the Open Meeting Act can be found guilty of a misdemeanor and may be personally liable for actual and exemplary damages if not more than $500 per single incident, per single meeting. So there is some, some financial um, as well as legal repercussions for violating the Open Meetings Act. Now, as you set your agenda, it is your guide for conducting official business of your board or, or council or commission. Um, your presiding officer in consultation with your clerk sets the agenda. They send out the agenda with that supporting information. Usually you're thinking about that as your board packet. In parliamentary procedure, the presiding officer would be advised to set a deadline before each meeting to receive agenda items. And that, sh that deadline should allow enough time for that agenda to be produced, get information out to the public, as well as you as elected. Um, in local government, the time for receiving that agenda is usually set by local rule. So within your own particular council's rules of procedure. Trustees, council members, commissioners, um, you should set this with enough time before the meeting so that people can digest their board packets. 
because again, we want that logical decision making based on facts and information. And it also helps keep the pace of the meeting going. Um, I, I know that those of you um, who have a lot of experience with recorded meetings, uh, before we used to record meetings, we used to see um, elected on a continual basis, open their board packets for the first time during a meeting and are reading and digesting that information there. And it, and it would make mayors and, and city managers and um, it, it, township supervisors crazy. Um, ever since we started recording meetings, we find that, that, that all of us are much better prepared coming into those meetings because we don't want to be seen on local TV or on your YouTube channel uh, preparing for that meeting on the spot. Your agenda is your roadmap for your meeting, and it's an outline of all items to be considered um, in order of priority. So it lists items to be considered at the meeting. It may state what action is actually requested of you at that meeting. Um, that agenda is used to discourage adding last minute items to the agenda. And items received after the deadline are normally held over until the next meeting, unless a majority of you at that meeting actually um, uh, want to uh, vote to present that at your meeting and address it. Your sample agenda includes your, your call to order, your roll call, your quorum check, um, your invocation, pledge of allegiance. Um, we will have approval of media, uh, minutes from your previous meeting, approval of the order of the agenda, um, any called public hearings, um, public forums, citizen comment time. By the way, it doesn't have to be in that order. That, that citizen uh, comment time could come at the end. Reports then, um, items on your consent ag agenda, and we'll talk about a consent agenda shortly. Any older unfinished business as well as new business, tabled items, general comments, and then your adjournment. So, um, this is something that you might like to have, certainly, for those of you who are wondering whether you could have a copy of the slides or not. Now, what is a consent agenda? Well, a consent agenda is very useful when you've got a great deal of business to consider, so we don't have meetings that go on forever. And what that will include are items that require a decision, but they're not controversial items. They're action items, perhaps, for which little or, or no discussion is actually anticipated. Maybe you've previously discussed these issues in a previous council meeting, um, but they just need final approval. Um, now, any item on a consent agenda could be removed from that consent agenda and discussed by the full group um, with a separate vote taken on them if requested by one or more members of your council or commission or, or township board. They can be at the beginning of, in, of the event or near the end. Um, it doesn't really make a difference because these are non-controversial items and they rarely involve any public comment. Um, this could be the issuance of, of permits. Maybe you, um, you know, during construction season, you've got street closure requests. Um, maybe, you know, we're authorizing payment of bills. So your consent agenda is used to save time. It's not to discourage public participation. Um, and, and this is not really where we would be seeing public comment taking place. Now, in terms of preparing for meetings, you are elected to make decisions that will impact your community's future and you owe it to them to represent them well. So read your board packets, do your homework, talk to citizens, uh, study the issues, have your facts in hand before the meeting, review them. Um, get information from staff members before arriving at meetings, including pertinent municipal ordinances. Evaluate your alternatives, be prepared to discuss them. Um, have enough information in hand that you can calmly and confidently address those issues. 
and then listen to others as carefully as you would expect them to listen to you. Have that decorum, have that demeanor. Now, in terms of parliamentary procedure, um, and, and we say most um, work within parliamentary procedure, um, but um, you, your rule of order may be different within your community. Um, parliamentary procedure provides the process for proposing, amending, approving, and defeating any legislative motions within um, your board. It's not required, but rec recommended because it creates efficiency, it creates confidence by the public in your process. You may adopt by ordinance or resolution your own set of rules regarding conduct of your meetings, but parliamentary procedure is what most go with. Now, your basic rules of parliamentary procedure is that organizational rights supersede individual rights. We're trying to maintain order. All members are equal and expected to attend your meetings, make motions, debate those motions and vote. A quorum must be present to conduct business and a quorum is the number of members required to, uh, to be present to legally conduct business. And again, your quorum may be different in your board or council or commission, depending on your charter. In terms of majority rule, the minority has the right to be heard, but you will abide by the majority's decision. And silence is consent. So non-voting members agree to accept the majority decision. And we'll talk in a little bit um, about uh, conflict of interest and why you might not be voting on an issue. Motions must directly relate to the question under consideration. Once a speaker has been granted the floor, another member may not interrupt them, and the presiding officer may not put a debatable motion to a vote as long as members wish to debate it. Once a question is decided, it's generally out of order to bring up that same motion um, or one that's essentially like it at another meeting. Personal remarks and personal attacks are always out of order in debate. So the debate, we stick to the issue, we stick to the principles, we do not do personal attacks. Now, people violate this all the time in terms of parliamentary procedure, but if you want to be a solid leader, if you wanna be respected on your board and in your community, you do not get in that dirt, you do not make it personal, you keep it professional. I always use the term stay a cut above. Two of the most misunderstood rules of parliamentary procedure are motions to table and call the question, and we will go through these. Now, rules enacted to establish order and preserve decorum of the meeting, your presiding officer has primary responsibilities for, for preserving order. So um, if you're on a council, um, this is going to be your, your, your mayor. Your legislators have immunity from liability for enforce, enforcement of council rules provided they do not have the intent to silence a speaker. Your rules enforce the will of the majority while respecting the ability of the minority to participate in dissent. Member public must allow others to speak without interruption. Um, which is why sometimes we have people removed from meetings. And we keep things simple. Complicated rules actually discourage the public's participation, which would be in violation of the Open Meetings Act. We don't wanna create anxiety about what's going on. It can feel manipulative. So within that parliamentary procedure, what most of you will follow is actually Robert's Rules of Order. And within Robert's Rules of Order, um, they are utilized to conduct productive and efficient meetings, to set guidelines for the making of motions, the management of debate on issues, and how to vote. Um, this is not mandated. This is a choice of yours to go with Robert's Rules of Orders. You can create your own rules of procedure as long as you defer to them 
where your charter and local ordinances are silent. So if within your charter, you're saying you're using Robert's Rules of Orders, you are. Um, you will follow an order of business formally within Robert's Rules of Orders. You don't depart from that. Um, it helps make it easier to prepare the agenda and the minutes. And again, what we're trying to do is build confidence by your public um, that, that you, you're in control and you have order. Now, in terms of public participation, you have the authority to adopt rules related to public comment, provided those rules are reasonable, flexible, and they don't discourage the public. So everything that we talked about earlier in terms of um, putting time limits to public comment, um, you can do that and we would expect you to do that. Um, one of the things that we wanna remind you of though, is that you have no need to respond to questions or demands during public comment. And actually what we recommend in order to keep order in your meeting is that you do not respond to questions or demands during public comment because your meeting will get out of control. Um, what we would recommend to you is when the public makes a comment, what do you say, even if you respectfully disagree with them, is thank you so much. That simple thank you is, is, is all that is needed. And you know you may want to designate a, a city official to follow up with a member of the public, but if you want a meeting to go off the rails, start answering questions to demands during public comment, and you will see it go off the rails. Um, and since we are going to make these slides available to you, I'm not going to go through all the acceptable policies for public comment according to the Attorney General's office. But do know that, that these are governed um, by the state. And so um, you do wanna follow this order. Um, you will have a sergeant at arms at your meetings and that individual is there to keep order in your meetings. Um, and again, uh, we, don't, um, we don't have a knee jerk reaction to somebody who is passionate um, who gets out of order, you know, and you want to give them a warning first, perhaps you ask them to stay on topic or ask them to refrain from profanity or name calling. Uh, but if they do not refrain from that and they've had that warning, often your police chief uh, will be the sergeant in arms at your meeting. And um, you are not going to remove them because you disagree with what they're saying. Um, you can remove a person because they're threatening or out of control behavior. Now, let's talk about motions. Motions are used to introduce a subject or to propose an action to council or commission. And so the language that you would use within Robert's Rules of Orders might be a, a trustee might say, I move that an ordinance or resolution be adopted on such and such an issue. Um, once you make that motion, um, that motion needs to be seconded by another member of your uh, board of trustees or your council or commission before it will be discussed and acted upon. Requests to remove a motion can only be done with majority approval not by the person who actually surfaced that motion in the first place. So literally you will use that language. I move that such and such an ordinance or resolution be adopted. Now we have two types of motions. Main motions propose very substantive action. And so for example, a main motion might promote, uh, propose that a city do a study, organize a community event or hire staff, Virtually any proposal related to the objectives of, uh, of your city or township qualifies as a main motion. Secondary motions, on the other hand, propose actually procedural action. So this is not substantive, but this is within your process. They relate to the operation of your meetings. So for an example, a secondary motion might be a proposal to limit the amount of debate, to table 
a motion to go back and study it some more, uh, to refer a main motion to a committee or actually adjourn the meeting. All of those are considered secondary motions. Now, when you have a motion, uh, you will make that motion. Someone will second that motion. Your clerk is taking that information down. Then you state the motion before your council. And then um, your ruling uh, person, so this might be your township supervisor, it might be your, your mayor, will open that for discussion or debate. Um, they will not put that motion to a vote until that debate has been fully vetted. And then, uh, you know, when you take that roll call on that, on that vote, uh, they will then announce the results of that vote. And the clerk, again, will capture the announcement of that result. So those are motions. When it comes to discussion, the chair uh, of that board does the following. They announce the agenda item, clearly discussing the subject, and they invite reports from whoever um, can bring that information. It might be an advisory committee. It might be a staff member. Um, they ask you then if you have any technical questions that require any clarification. So this is part of the discussion. They may actually ask for public comments or a uh, public hearing at that time. Then they announce that uh, public input has concluded um, and that the balance of the discussion now will be in your laps. So it will be limited to council, um, commission, your board, unless for some reason um, you decide to waive that discussion by majority vote. So in that discussion, they will invite a motion from you. And when that is received and seconded, um, knowing now, I, I mean, if it's seconded, that ensures that the motion is clearly understood. They will either repeat that um, by asking the clerk to reread that motion, or they may ask you or, or whoever is the author of that motion to repeat it. And then they moderate a discussion of the item until that motion is ready for a vote or maybe another disposition like tabling it to another meeting. And by transacting the council's business in that fashion, it provides a very consistent methodology for decision-making. Um, and it also keeps you from knee-jerk reactions. It gives you that, um, that process to ensure that you have fully vetted and understood issues before voting. Now, you might decide to table a motion. And if after considerable debate, the council still may not be ready to vote on the motion, then you may propose that the motion um, be postponed until the next meeting, maybe so that you can gather more information. Um, you set it aside until later. And that allows you to pursue more urgent business of the meeting. Um, maybe you need um, additional time to, um, to perhaps uh, draft a permit. Um, a motion to be taken from the table brings it back before the meeting. Now, we have what we call calling the question. And when someone calls a question, you are asking for the motion to be put to a vote. So you don't call um, a, a question while still debating. A motion to call the question or limit debate, again, needs to be seconded, and it requires two thirds of majority vote in order to proceed with a vote for that motion on the floor. So if you're, if you're a mayor, your township supervisor has not called for a vote, one of you may call the question to put that to a vote. The presiding officer will call for the vote. Um, the majority rules, you follow your procedures in terms of maybe doing a roll call or your eyes or your nays, um, whatever is found within your charter there in terms of voting. You may choose to abstain from a vote 
under Robert's rules of order. And when abstaining from a vote, we say abstentions are counted and noted, but they are not as a yes or a no vote. An abstention does not affect the voting result. So you have a right to abstain and you cannot be compelled to vote on an issue. And actually, whenever there is a conflict of interest, you actually have an obligation um, to abstain from that vote. If you have a personal interest in a matter, um, maybe you've got a business that's going to be affected by that vote, or you may have a legal conflict of interest. So you, you have a duty to abstain from a vote in those instances. So some samples of abstentions. In our first scenario, if you have a five member board and it takes a majority of yes votes to pass, if you have two members that vote yes, okay, and you have two members that vote no, and one abstains, the result is the matter does not pass because the abstention does not count as a vote, so you did not have a majority in favor. You needed three and you only had two. In our second scenario, we've got a seven member of council um, of, a, a, of a code that the city council is voting on in the passage of an ordinance. Three people voted yes, two voted no, and you had two abstentions. The result, again, is that the ordinance does not pass because a state law applicable to non-charter uh, code cities is that it requires an affirmative vote of a majority of the whole. Well, if you only had three on a seven person council, you did not have a majority passing in that. So, um, that's that's how abstentions can impact voting. But again, you have a duty there to abstain if you have a conflict of interest. Now, we've talked about motions. We've talked about um, calling to question. We've uh, talked about discussions. Now, about resolutions. Resolutions are less formal than ordinances. They're often used for short-term manners, such as a, you know, passing a resolution to adopt an annual budget. It's used to state the council's position in support or opposition to a piece of perhaps state or federal legislation. Oftentimes, uh, you may be commenting on other, um, uh, other um, aspects of government. You might uh, wish to commend a citizen or commemorate an occasion, and you might use a resolution to do that. Um, what they do um, is they are actually used to become a, a, a permanent part of the record of the board. So the most common municipal resolutions are to express the opinion of your governing body on a certain issue to another local um, or another level of, of government. So you might want to go on the record regarding something that the National League of Cities has done or that the Municipal League has done. And so we have a sample here. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to um, read this verbatim. It's, it will be in your PowerPoint. But we have given you an example here of a resolution um, where a, a city um, uh, it stood in opposition to and condemnation of racist and divisive graffiti and vandalism within your community. And actually this example is coming from um, Muskegon Heights. So um, you might want to refer to that one as an example of what you might see in a resolution. Ordinances, on the other hand, are formal actions by council. And, and, and this is constituting local legislation. So these are, these are within your legal guidelines. And, they carry the force of law and they may impose penalties on violators. Uh, they should always be done in the public's interest. And if council wants to change um, an adopted ordinance, it either has to amend, it has to repeal, or it needs to rescind that ordinance. And again, 
your clerk is required by state law to maintain an ordinance book and from time to time a village may compile or codify all of its current ordinances and publish or compile that. Um, and again, oftentimes you've got a link uh, on your website to take you to those ordinances. Um, and again, we've got a sample of an ordinance here. So you know, no person shall store any junk vehicle except as where permitted and in accordance with this code. The storage of such vehicles in violation of this article should be declared a nuisance. All junk vehicles shall be re removed and disposed of at a legally established disposal site. And so uh, you've got the force of law there behind that ordinance. So there is, there is a repercussion if somebody does not follow this ordinance. As if we haven't covered enough here, we also have closed sessions. And you may be meeting in closed session only for one or more of, of permitted purposes within Section 8 of the Open Meetings Act. So you might be in a closed session to consider um, personnel issues within the, the city, the township, the township. Um, for strategy and negotiation sessions. If you have bargained for employees and you're going into a collective bargaining agreement, um, you may have a closed session around that. Or if you're considering the purchase or lease of property um, up to the time you are actually considering an option to purchase or lease that property, you may go into closed session on that. You may have a closed session to consult with the city attorney regarding a trial or a settlement um, in connection with pending litigation and where an open meeting act would actually have a, a financial um, negative repercussion on the city. To review or consider the contents again of an application for um, employment to a public office. So like if you, um, if you are looking to hire a, a, a city manager, you may go into closed session to review that application, but you will also interview that city manager candidate um, in a public meeting. And to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute. So all of these are reasons why you might go into closed session. And you may go into closed section, session actually in the course of a normal meeting. But you have to announce this. You need a two thirds roll call of members um, in order to call a closed session. You do that roll call vote for the purpose of calling that. Um, and that again is entered into the minutes by the clerk. And um, a majority vote is sufficient for going into closed session for other open meetings um, cited permitted processes. So you will actually move to, um, and, and by the way, this would be a secondary motion. Um, this is a procedural issue to go into closed session. Now, when you leave a closed section, session, the Open Meetings Act is silent as to how to leave that. We suggest that you recommend a motion to end that closed session and have a majority vote um, to support that. And then when you conclude your closed session, the Open Meetings Act um, states the time the public body reconvenes. And again, that's going to be put into your meeting um, notes. You are not going to be voting on matters discussed in your closed session in the closed session. You actually are going to come back to your open meeting for that. And so decisions will be made in the open meeting, not in closed. And that's actually designated again by the Open Meetings Act, so you're not going to go there. And then we talked before about um, um, emergency meetings and those um, may waive that 18 hour requirement, um, but these have to be basically a severe and imminent threat to 
public safety, the health and welfare of your community. They take a two thirds vote of your members to ha actually have an emergency meeting. Um, and oftentimes, not only are you, again, publicly posting that and pub putting a link on your website or keeping it on your, your homepage, um, but we encourage you to have uh, paper copies at that meeting to notify people as to what the issue is that would require an emergency meeting. So, all of these things are around the Sunshine Act and transparency in office. Um, and why? Because as a public official, you represent the public. We want to get away from any, um, any actual self-interest, um, as well as any perceived self-interest. A conflict of interest, making sure that our meetings are well attended and that we have proper procedure around voting. So let's talk about duty of loyalty. And, and this is our, our segue for actually going into some of the ethical issues. Your duty of loyalty is inherent in local government and it requires you to avoid conflict of interest self-dealing, exploiting your, your position on a board or council or commission um, for personal gain or for personal gain of any of your family members. And this duty of loyalty is codified in various statutes in, in the state. Now, a conflict of interest arises when the personal interest of a public official places them in a position where you cannot execute your public duties without affecting your private interests. And therefore, this would deny the public a fair, impartial, and objective judgment to which they are entitled. So the duty of loyalty that you are committing to prohibits self-dealing and voting on decisions where you or a family member might personally gain from the outcome. And uh, Michigan compiled laws actually incorporates facets of the duty of loyalty by, by prohibiting disclosing confidential information acquired in the course of serving, you know, the township, the city before public disclosure is authorized by the board. So um, maybe, it, it, you know, this might be a, a, a zoning decision that might impact someone's purchase or um, you know, getting rid of a property, personally benefiting from the knowledge or use of confidential information, using the knowledge that you gain through the, the township, the city, the commission, or uh, excuse me, the county, um, using their resources, property, or funds for personal gain or benefit or negotiating or executing contracts, making loans or issuing permits, if you have a financial interest with that board member. So this hits at ethical issues. And if only ethics were as easy as laws, because as we define ethics, and you'll actually find this printed on uh, the Michigan Townships Association website, principles that define behavior as right, good, and proper. And I always follow that when I'm training with, according to who? <laughs> Standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do. According to who? Striving to ensure that we and the institutions we represent live up to the standards that are reasonable and solidly based. According to who? Ethics are not laws, but what they do is they set the standard for what your community would perceive as right, good, proper, reasonable, what we should be doing, what would be reasonable and solidly based within your constituents, the majority of those constituents. So, 
if you have ethics policies or ordinances. And even though they are not the letter of the law, we really encourage you to have an ethics policy or ordinance um, to follow because they help us, they help us guide our, our own behavior. If you don't have an ethics policy or ordinance, we would recommend that you do create them. And as I said very early in this training today, consider all consequences as if they were to be viewed by the public. And please trust your gut. If it feels wrong, don't do it. Now, some things for you to be considering around ethics, gifts, compensation, economic interest. You do not want to accept anything that could be inferred as influencing you in the performance of your official duties or to be perceived that you have been re rewarded for a vote. Preferential treatment, usage of position to secure privileges, exemptions, advantages, contracts, preferential treatment for yourself or for a relative. Uh-uh. The use of information. Information garnered in the course of your official duties will not be used to further the private economic interests of yourself or relative. Uh, doing business with the city. If you have a business, no direct or indirect business without complete written disclosure of that economic interest. Written disclosure of that. And the use of city property, we say no use of city or county property for economic, um, private economic interest by yourself or relative. I mean, literally, I, I worked with a city um, a few years back where the, the ethical issue is that um, there was a council member who promoted, um, he was active in his church and there was a public event taking place in that city and he was actively promoting renting chairs for that public activity from his church. I'm sorry, that's an ethical issue. And he, great, within a church. Um, but no, you do not want to do that. And whenever there is anything that is even mildly uh, perceived as a conflict of interest or an ethical issue, you are going to abstain from voting on that and you are going to document um, what that conflict of interest is. Now, in terms of the acceptance of gifts, and, and this is also going uh, recommended for uh, not only elected, but um, city or township employees. A gift is anything of value that exceeds $25 in a month, including anything to aid the defense of an official against legal action not directly related to their governmental duties. So a gift is not a reported campaign contribution. It's not a gift from a family member. So you can still have your holidays. A gift is not food or beverage to be consumed immediately. It's not a contribution to a registered legal defense fund whose purpose is to defend you against an action that arises from your um, official duties. But let that $25 um, guideline. And, um, you know, if, if you have any concern in your community about the perception around gifts, do not accept them, even if they are under that $25 range. Now, we define a conflict of interest as the public officer promptly disclosing, again, in writing, any personal, contractual, financial, business, employment interest you might have in any decision being made by your board. And what we want you to do is disclose that, make that part of the public record of the official action, even before you would abstain from a vote. Now, we are talking about ethics and duty of loyalty. Um, 
I was doing a workshop, I think this was through the Michigan Municipal League, and we had somebody uh, from St. Joseph who was in that uh, workshop. And they actually shared with us, and they gave us permission um, to share this with others, um, a civility um, statement that they actually use that not only covers government officials, but um, Emily and Contessa, it, it, it covers their, their chamber of commerce and their, their foundations. And I absolutely loved it. So I brought it here for you to see this as well. Uh, St. Joseph County is committed to encouraging, creating and sustaining an environment that, um, that honors the inherent dignity of every member of our community. Respectful behavior should always be the norm in all forms of communication and in all situations. And then they literally go through and say, as a community, we welcome a diverse range of perspectives and opinions and uphold the importance of civil debate. We fully support the free exchange of ideas and beliefs, as well as the expression of provocative or less popular ideas. We believe that only through the process of open and honest dialogue can we generate knowledge and deepen our mutual understanding. And we believe that all members of the community have a responsibility to behave in a manner that does not harm others and shows respect for those with different opinions. Behavior that attacks, humiliates, belittles, or conveys personal hatred towards others diminishes our thriving and safe community environment. Words and actions matter. Everyone's asked to do their part in creating a healthy and positive community and a culture that truly values each person's uniqueness, experience, and perspectives. I love this. It's all right to disagree, but not to be disagreeable. And they attributed this to um, Father Hesberg um, from Notre Dame. I don't know if any of you love or hate um, Notre Dame, but I, I so appreciated and everybody in the workshop that we were doing would ju was just so struck by this civility statement as actually setting the tone for the community. Um, I was at Northwood University um, a, a year or two back and somebody, um, it, it, the, the speaker that I was listening to um, they were actually talking about civil discourse. And he made a comment that as leaders, our job is to set the temperature of the room every time we enter it. And I loved that statement because in fact, as leaders, we can set that temperature at a hundred degrees and watch all Hades break loose. Or we can bring that temperature down and along with that temperature coming down, provide that level of calm amongst people. And it, it, it just really supported um, what I had just heard within that last year from St. Joseph when they shared their statement on civility. So um, this was so meaningful. I just really wanted to share it and also uh, give St. Joseph across their community um, the, the credit that they deserved for doing that. And um, I'm not going to go through this, um, but it is in your slides here on why they crafted the statement, how they actually wanted to implement it, because they, they do want board chairs and mayors and board presidents to, to use this as a guideline and, and how it would cover the nonprofit sector as well as the local government sector. Um, and so anyway, I, I thought it was beautiful and I thought it was worthy of sharing with you. Now we are on the home stretch here. So some considerations for those of you who are newly elected. 
um, some things to have at the top of your mind. Not every problem is going to be an easy fix. And if you think it's easy, stop. Because everything that, that is a knee-jerk reaction probably has some unintended consequences that we have not considered. Process impacts the content of decision-making. So be prepared, gather your data, trust but verify information, and consistently go back to logical decision-making. Process impacts content. If you do not do your homework, that's going to impact the quality of your decision-making. You have information and perspective that your citizens don't have. And therefore, even during that Open Meetings Act, and we are hearing from citizens, maybe we're having that neighborhood meeting, you may have information that they don't have uh, that will help you um, act in a reasonable and logical manner. You are always learning. So if there is one thing that you could walk away with, listen more than you speak. And actually, I loved a ground rule um, that I learned again in another training that I was doing. I love doing training because I always learn more from the people I'm training than, um, than what I'm sharing with others. Um, worked with a municipality where their ground rule because they thought their elected loved to hear each other speak, that their elected were in the business of continuing to be elected next term. And so they came up with the ground rule that more than a minute is, spe is a speech and no speeches are allowed in our meetings. How awesome a ground rule is that? More than a minute is a speech and we're not allowing speeches in our meetings, which meant you had to think before you spoke. Follow your media relations plan. You likely have one spokesperson. Um, if you do not have one spokesperson as a board or a council or a commission, you should craft talking points so that you have consistent talking points going out to the public. Please respect staff. They can and will set you up for success. Um, but you are not demonstrating respect of staff if you are micromanaging them. Please be professional. Stay a cut above. And by the way, prepare in advance for your hot buttons. And if you prepare in advance, if you know what your hot buttons are, you can already rehearse. You can script out how you will respond once somebody presses that hot button. Um, I had somebody that was sent to one of my trainings once on conflict. Um, it was somebody from a DPW department and they were sent to the training because um, he, uh, you know, having a, a, a truck on the road, um, his hot button was actually when people would say, I pay your salary. And, and that just sent him off the edge. So they were fixing a curb in front of somebody's residence and um, the, the resident came out and she was miffed and she looked at him and she said, you know, I pay your salary. And this gentleman reached in his pocket, took out a quarter and he flipped it in her face and said, you can have your portion of my salary back. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, that was why he had had time off of work and why he was being sent um, to, to my training. But if, in effect, he already knew that that was a hot button, he should have been prepared for saying something professional and not something that would escalate the situation. So if you have hot buttons, prepare in advance for how you're going to approach those. Now, um, it looks like I already jumped the gun earlier by talking about Carver Board governance in terms of policy making. So I'm not going to repeat what we talked about earlier. Um, the, the biggest thing with Carver Board governance is that you look at your goals, you look at the, they call them the ends. What are the outcomes that you are looking for for your community? You have those reflected in your board policy 
and then you let your staff actually um, act on those. Now, as, as we are, are winding up, you are gonna build upon your strategic plan. Hopefully most of you have a strategic plan in place that includes your mission, it includes your vision, your values, and some of your initial goals. If you do not have a strategic plan in place, that is something that you want to get in order and you wanna get that in order um, very soon. And by the way, um, if you call someone in a third party, you know, it, I, I do a lot of neutral facilitation of strategic plans. The however is you don't call somebody like me in to do that without asking them to share their process so that you can then train your personnel within your city, your county, your township on how that can trickle down into each of their functions. So don't spend the dollars bringing somebody in to do a strategic plan and not learn their process so that you don't have to keep calling in a consultant to do that. That's not gonna be the best use of your funds. Do them one and done if you have a, a neutral facilitator come in and have them share that information with your team. From that strategic plan come your goals. And we use the acronym SMART for goals. Those goals should be very specific. What do you wanna do? They should have some measurables so that you can come back and say, uh, you know, quantitative, you know, how many streets did we want to pave in, in this upcoming year? We don't just wanna say we wanna pave the streets. We don't know without a measurable whether we achieve that goal or not. Ask yourselves, is this an achievable goal? Now, you may have some stretch goals out there, but is it achievable? Because you don't want to demotivate your team by giving them a goal that they can never achieve. Are they realistic? Or another R sometimes is relevant to your strategic plan. And then are they time bound? Are we doing goals that are not reasonable for the end of the fiscal year because of what is mandated by the state. So utilize that acronym on SMART goals to achieve your goals. Another tool that you may be using in your goal setting might be a SWOT analysis. And on a SWOT analysis, what you're doing is you're looking at your internal strengths and weaknesses, and then external opportunities and threats. And oftentimes what's being done in Lansing might be an opportunity or a threat to you, whatever that legislation is. You know, if we look at revenue sharing. Uh, that is definitely an opportunity or a threat within your community, but you've got to be aware of it so that you make decisions with that in mind. You should be establishing criteria for your decision making. And so what I, what I am showing you here um, are just examples of decision-making criteria. You might wanna take a look at risk. You might look at liability to the community. You might wanna look at the capital that you have available. Um, part of your decision might be from your public hearings, your citizen forums and the information that you garnered there. Maybe the impact of short-term tax costs versus long-term benefit of, of, of facilities. Um, I'm not saying these are your only decision-making criteria, but if you're going to make good logical decisions, you should have some criteria for that decision-making. And then community engagement will help you with sustainability. And so how do we get our community engaged in, in boards and community forums, neighborhood discussions? Do you do any listening sessions? Do you do any surveys out in your community? Do you take advantage of, of the information you can garner from partnerships with your chamber of commerce, with your key employers in your community, your educational institutions, your nonprofits? And so as we call this training session to an end, what it takes for you to be successful is to demonstrate your knowledge about your respective city, county, village, township law, 
your, your responsibilities. Your ability to identify the major functions so that you stay within your parameters. That you communicate, but even more effectively, that you be an effective listener to your constituents. That you stay with the logical on decision making. And that you have tools to support decision making, including those planning tools of your master plan, your strategic plan your organizational tools, your public support, your, uh, your thought processes that always go to the good of, whole, of the whole, that learning mindset and not staying with the status quo, and that respectful decision-making that, that always tries to reach consensus and uses the majority vote as, a, as your backup plan, that you manage conflict, adversity, hostility, that civility statement I love, that you demonstrate ethical behavior, that you possess a vision, especially relative to your community's needs. Are you that visionary? And are you open to change to advance your community? Do you understand your roles and others' roles as elected officials? Do you demonstrate knowledge of your committees, particularly your planning commission? Do you understand how policy and procedure are set? And do you have you learned how to be budget savvy? Utilize long-term master planning and strategic planning. Do you demonstrate how to stay within policy rather than being a locally board and craft ordinances that are lawfully adopted and legally enforced? Do you demonstrate that willingness to stay in the policy realm? and allow employees to do their jobs. So within that, um, if you need um, to get a hold of me, I'm, I'm providing my contact information for you here. Um, people, uh, it, it, Shelley through MTA can easily get a, a hold of me. Um, Dan Gilmartin and others at the Michigan Municipal League um, can find me contacts at the National League of Cities. Um, so if you lose this information um, or, or the team here um, through the greater Muskegon area, certainly will be able to find me if you've got some questions or if you need any follow-up. So with that thought in mind, what last questions did you have? All right, we do have quite a few questions in the chat. So we'll go ahead and answer some of those. Okay, so the first question is, um, when discussing closed sessions, oh, I'm sorry, actually looking at the wrong question. Just one second. This one, okay. Can you please cover the value, importance, and management of consent agencies? Agendas. Yes, agendas. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and give me the three things that were wanted within consent agendas. The value, um, the value um, importance, and management of consent agendas. Okay, and really what we're looking at is total management of your meeting. And, um, and your ability as a board or a council to prioritize issues. And you are not, you know, you're probably, you know, I, I don't know how often you are meeting, whether it's every other week, whether it's uh, once a month, depending on your charter, but because you only get together a limited number of times, you've got to focus your issues on the high priority issues within your council. And so the consent agenda actually demonstrates the lower value, the lower priority items, or things that have already been discussed by council, and now we just need to revisit on a very brief basis. And so that is the value. And we publish what is on that consent agenda so that within the Open Meetings Act, the public is aware of what's in that but that then opens up our time 
to dedicate on the truly vital issues issues for your for your community. Thank you, Nancy. You bet. Are you able to have a closed session to consider the sale of a property rather than the purchase? Kathy, you look like you wanted to address that. <laughs> oh, you go ahead, Nancy. My understanding is no. <laughs> um, we are an open forum. And so, um, and Kathy, um, my understanding is similar to yours. So you are not going to go into closed session on, on the sale of, of that property. I can say there's certainly times that I wanted to be able to, <laughs> but the attorney said no. Okay. Oh, and by the way, you know, don't don't forget your 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 city attorney is a great resource. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next one we have. Um, it says we have two minute timer on public comment. You showed three minutes on your slides. Is that common? Oh, um, and actually that is up to you in your community. Oh shoot, I ran into a community just a, a couple months ago. They had a seven minute time <laughs> on public comments. And I, and I just, I, 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 I wanted to take myself out, out of there immediately. So yeah, if you have a two minute timer, that is perfectly acceptable. Um, I generally see two to three minutes from people who lay that as a ground rule. So yeah, you're okay. Nancy, I would, I would just add that sometimes um, commissions and councils and boards have a set time for an individual, but a longer time if somebody's representing an organization and then they're the only one to speak to that issue, like a neighborhood association or, you know, that type of thing. And uh, Kathy, that is a great addition. And you've just taught me something because I have not seen that before. And if you don't mind, I'll steal that when dealing with other cities. That is a great recommendation. Sure. Okay, next question. What if you have three yes, three no's, and one um, absentation? How does that get rolled? So there's six total with one being up. Well, it depends on whether you are talking uh, for, for most, it is, most um, cities are working on a majority vote. And so it would not pass because you do not have the majority. All right. Thank you, Nancy. The next one we have is how would a county commission create an ordinance? How would they create an ordinance? Yep. Oh, that is a lot longer than, the <laughs> than no, seriously, than the time we have available here. So you, you may want to reach out to me after this meeting. That's probably best done afterwards, yeah. Great. Okay. okay, is the only reason you can abstain from a vote because of a conflict of interest? Or is there another reason you can abstain? Oh, you can you can abstain for any reason. All right. The next one. Now, by the way, do I do I recommend you just abstaining because you didn't want to weigh in, or you know, <laughs> or you didn't want to take the unpopular road with your constituents? No, I don't advocate for that. But you can. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Nancy. Um, the next one we have, uh, how do you handle a commissioner that just goes on and on trying to wear you down when the opinion is not the majority? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> um, you do not have a lot of recourse in your meeting. Um, and so what, what you really want to do is you want to um, you, you wanna give that commissioner some, some counsel on a one-on-one -on -one basis in terms of how they are serving the needs of the public versus not. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm sure many of you in this room are, are dealing with this issue. Um, again, we can professionally 
give guidance to our council members and our commissioners. Um, you know, I, I told you about the humorous approach, you know, more than one minute of speech and no speeches allowed. But within that Open Meetings Act, we cannot cut that, we're not gonna be cutting that person off. We may ask them questions to direct them toward closure. And that's probably your most professional means to cut them off, ask them closed ended questions to help get them there. Um, but that's about the best that you can do. Kathy, did you wanna say anything else on that? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Nancy. I know we're over time and you have other meetings to do. Um, so if you have any other questions, I know there's a few in the chat we're not able to get answered. Um, you can send those to, you know, Kathy, Contessa, or I, and we will get those answered by Nancy. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us this morning um, and, and for being so interested in in wearing that mantle of responsibility well and effectively on behalf of your communities. So we thank you for your service and appreciate you. So you all take care. And I just want to say thank you to Nancy. It's been fantastic. I'm so glad that you were able to lead our training. I think it's been helpful to all of us. I also want to invite Everybody that's participated today, as a reminder, you should have also gotten notices about our upcoming trainings next week. On May 19th, we have the Planning Commission Zoning Board of Appeals training at 7.30 in the morning and the DDA training at noon, both on May 19th. So um, you're all welcome to join those, whether you're on those um, boards or committees or not. Uh, we'd love to have you participate with those too. So. And thank you also to Emily and Contessa for all your help in running the meeting. So thank you all oh, and have a good day. And folks, the devil is in the details. So they set us up for success. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>